Hello everyone, my aim in this video is to help you gain a bit of intuition as to the physical origin of the Coriolis force. Now the reason I'm doing this is that the Coriolis force can seem like a very weird effect when you first hear about it. Like if you're in a rotating frame and you throw a ball or something directly ahead of you in a straight line, then it's not actually going to move in a straight line. It's either going to curve to its right or to its left, depending on the sense of your rotation. And we can actually gain a bit of insight into why that is just by considering a very simple case. And so what we're going to do is imagine first that we're in an inertial frame. Okay, so a non-rotating frame and think about an object which is just flying along in a straight line with a constant velocity. And our object, I'm going to represent it with a cross. Okay, so I'm going to draw it in the center of this circle that I've drawn here, which represents our inertial frame. And it's going to move from the center of the circle out to the radius in a vertical line. Okay, and so if we think about where that object is going to be halfway through the motion, it's going to be in the middle of those two points. And then we can subdivide this time interval into even smaller, um, smaller intervals. So for example, a quarter of the way through the motion, it's there and three quarters of the way through the motion, it's there. So what we have now is five snapshots at specific moments in time, equally spaced intervals in time um, of, of where our object is going to be. And so Next, we're going to introduce our rotating observer. Okay, so we're going to imagine we're sitting at the, the edge of this circle, and we're going to start at the bottom like that. Okay, so this dot at the bottom, that represents um, the observer who's, who's watching the motion of this object. Okay, and our observer is going to be rotating anti-clockwise with an angular speed of omega. Okay, and so what we want to do is think about at these five instants that we've drawn our object, where is the observer at those particular moments? All right, and so because they're just rotating around clockwise, sorry, anti-clockwise with a uh, constant angular speed, what's going to happen is that, uh, well, if we call, you know, this initial time t equals zero, then um, we could call this next time uh, instant capital T, this next one will be 2t and so on, you'd have 3t and 4t. So this is our t equals zero case at the bottom. When t equals capital T, the object would have just moved around to somewhere over here, right? So that would be a time of capital T. And then because the angular, the angular velocity is constant, after a time of 2t, that angle that, that it's rotated around by would just be twice as big. Okay, so you've got these equally spaced angular intervals. And then we can draw on the, um, the next two positions as well, somewhere over there um, and somewhere over here. Okay, so that would be 3t and, and 4t. Okay, and now uh, all we're going to do is think about the line of sight of that observer. So if we imagine we're sitting on the edge of this circle and spinning around, it could be like a roundabout or something, and we're just always looking directly ahead of us, right? Our line of sight at t equals zero is just going to be uh, a straight line that goes up like that. Okay, so there's our line of sight at t equals zero. Where's the line of sight going to be when t equals capital T? Well, if we're still looking straight ahead of us, we're looking along the radius, we're looking along a radius or a diameter of the circle, right? And so it's still going to cross over, cross through the center of the circle, and our line of sight is going to look like that. Okay, and we can do a similar thing. We can draw these lines of sight for um, the five different time intervals that we have. Okay, so let's do that. And the line of sight at a time of 3t is over there. And finally, at a time of 4t, it's somewhere, um, somewhere over there. Okay, so these diameters that I've drawn, these are just the lines of sight of our observer. And so at this stage, we're actually almost done, because what we want to do is draw the path of the object from the perspective of the rotating observer. And so that's why we've drawn these lines of sight. Now, notice that when t equals zero, the line of sight um, actually crosses through, it passes through the object at t equals zero. It doesn't quite look like that's the case from this diagram, because I haven't done it particularly carefully, but uh, the object um, at t equals zero, right here, is actually lying on the line of sight for the t equals zero case. Okay, and so that means when t equals zero, the observer still sees the object in that same place, in the center of the circle, which is kind of logical, right? And our observer, in the rotating frame, remember, our observer is not actually um, moving 
by definition of the rotating frame because that's the frame in which the observer is at rest. Okay, so the observer is just sitting there at the bottom. Let me kind of reposition that slightly, I guess more like here. And so what happens at a time of capital T? Well, if we look at this line of sight uh, when T is capital T, it's this one here, right? And then what's going to happen is that our observer is going to see uh, the object, you know, the position of the object at that time is this second cross here. And so the observer has to look to their right in order to see that object. And they have to look to their right by some angle, um, which is this angle here, right? So we could call that um, theta, for instance, right? And so what I'm going to draw on is I'm going to put the line of sight of the observer on this diagram on the right as well. Okay. And so after a time of capital T, right, in the inertial frame, the object was like somewhere over here, but the observer sees that object an angle theta to their right. Okay, so we take this point and we just rotate it round by some angle theta, and so the observer sees the object as being there, right? And so, in fact, I think that should be slightly, that should be a quarter of the way up, right? And so, in fact, I'm going to put the positions of the, uh, um, object in the inertial frame one here as well. Okay, so like that, splitting this interval into quarters. And then, you know, the perceived position uh, at a time of capital T is going to be, we take that point, rotate it round by an angle of theta to the right. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to end up somewhere, somewhere there. Okay, then we just follow the same procedure when T is two times capital T. So we're looking at this line of sight over here on the left. Okay. So where does the observer see the object relative to themselves at that time, right? The relevant position of the object now is this one that corresponds to a time of 2t, but that is an even bigger angle away to the right. Okay, so the relevant angle there is um, this one, okay? And that's going to be an angle of 2 theta. It's just twice as big. Um, which is because the angular velocity or angular speed is a constant, right? And so if we plot that in the rotating frame, we take this second point and we move it around to the right by an angle which is twice as big, something like this, and um, the object is going to end up somewhere over here. Okay, so we then repeat the procedure. I'm not going to go through all the details because it's pretty much the same, right? We'd look at the line of sight, the next line of sight, we'd conclude that the angle, um, the angle that the observer sees the object at is three times as big. So that angle there. So we would take this point, rotate it round by three times that angle and find that it ends up somewhere over here. And at the end of the motion, right? Um, so when the observer is all the way over here, we look along this line of sight and we see the object is, um, well, all the way along here. So an angle of four theta. So we would take this point, rotate it around along the radius and end up somewhere over here. And if we join up, try to join up that path, right? The object is moving in a curved path. It's not moving in a straight line. It was moving in a straight line in the inertial frame, um, but it's kind of bent round to its right. Okay. And so what's happened is, you know, initially the velocity of our object was directed vertically upwards, but then it's as if it felt a force towards its right. So it received a little kick to its right and it ended up here. And similarly at that position, when it was there, right, it was kind of moving, its velocity was out in this direction, but then it received another little kick to its right and so on. And it keeps getting this little push to its right, which is exactly what the Coriolis force is, right? It's just this um, force that, well, if your frame is rotating anticlockwise like this, the force is gonna push you to, to the right, okay? and one other thing to notice is that if we think in terms of vectors, the angular velocity vector, um, I've written this omega down here as a scalar, but we could turn into a vector, put an arrow above it, and as a vector, because it's going anticlockwise, our velocity vector, angular velocity vector, will be pointing out of the page, right? And we can show a vector coming out of the page or out of the screen, sorry, um, as a circle with a little dot in it. And notice that the little kick, right, the little push or the force that the object is feeling in the rotating frame is always, well, we can see from this diagram over here that I've drawn, the kick it's getting is always perpendicular to the velocity itself, right? So again, at this moment, it's kind of moving um, 
I guess, like somewhere over here, and then it receives a little kick downwards until it reaches that point there. So the Coriolis force that it's experiencing is always perpendicular to the velocity itself, but it's also perpendicular to the angular velocity vector because the angular velocity vector is always pointing out of the page. Okay, and so um, we can say that, well, this force, um, I'm saying force in inverted commas because it's a, a fictitious force, um, force is perpendicular both to the angular velocity vector and to the velocity vector of the object itself in the rotating frame. And so that kind of suggests, um, if you're familiar with vectors and cross products, that the Coriolis force, Fc, uh, is proportional to the velocity vector crossed with the angular velocity vector, which does indeed turn out to be the case. Um, if you go through this whole thing in full mathematical detail, I do have a video on that as well, if you're interested to see, see this derived more rigorously. So there you go, just by considering this uh, simple case of an object moving in a straight line and just plotting the position where our uh, rotating observer would see that object in their own frame, we can get a bit of insight into, into why this Coriolis force actually um, appears in the first place from a physical perspective. Um, and this leads to all sorts of things um, that we have to take account of on Earth. For example, if you fire a projectile, um, it's not actually going to go in a straight line, it's going to bend um, bend over to its to its right. Okay, so I hope this is uh, giving you a bit of insight into where the Coriolis force comes from. Um, and I'll see you again soon uh, for some more physics and maths.